Okay, I'll call the meeting to order, please. This is the Village of Riverside's Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, December 3rd, 2020. The time is 7.02. Please call the roll. President Sells. Here. Trustee Collins. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Galagos. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Giza. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Also present Village Clerk Haley. Thank you very much. Before we go any further, uh, Mr. Molina, I believe you had an announcement for us. Yes. So for members of the public, as well as the village board members and staff, under recent amendments to the Open Meetings Act, remote or virtual meetings are allowed as long as there is, is a gubernatorial declaration of a state of emergency, which there is currently one, uh, and there has been in a series that began in mid-March, and also conditioned on the village president, Ben Sells, finding that a, in, an in-person meeting would be either impractical or not in the interest of public health. And he has determined that both those conditions are present. And so the meeting is being held virtually with members of the public being able to participate through email uh, in writing through US mail or virtually through the Zoom uh, uh, platform. And in my opinion, those conditions have all been met and the meeting can be held virtually. And we do have a quorum. Uh, so back to you, President Sells. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone who is joining us on this uh, Zoom call. We do have a number of, of people joining us this evening for, uh, for discussion. Uh, we're going to try to do this as efficiently as we can via Zoom. If, if you would like to speak during public comment, which is going to be held after the presentation we're going to hear first, I do need to be able to see you on, on screen, so you would need to to activate your video. And if you want, if you would like to speak, I would ask that you physically raise your hand so that I can see you and then I will call on you. Uh, in the event that the my screen gets overpopulated and I can't see everyone, I will ask you to use the chat feature to just send everyone a, a chat message saying that you're in queue and would like to speak and I'll call on you uh, in order that's, that's received. But first up this evening, we are going to, to move on past the Pledge of Allegiance for obvious reasons, since we're all meeting remotely. And uh, first up is presentations and public comment. And we have a presentation this evening by Mr. Jeff Zucker of the Army Corps of Engineers and an update on the Groveland Avenue uh, levy project. Mr. Zucker, welcome. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, President Sells. I appreciate the opportunity to come before the board again and give an update on what we've been doing with Groveland Avenue Levy project. <clears throat> All right, so what are we gonna cover tonight uh, on this slide just shows, uh, we're gonna go over the proposed levy. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions about the modeling previously and uh, we've had some time to go out and look at what a design would best look like in this area. We have a couple of options to consider tonight uh, to at least put before you as a consideration. Uh, also, we'll go over the flood wall examples that we've shown. I have a few other considerations. I'll give an, uh, an overview of the project costs, a funding update on what has been spent so far, along with the proposed revised schedule, and then we'll have some chance for questions at the end. So next slide, please. I believe this is a picture that we've shown before, but just wanted to go over, since it's been a while, exactly what the features are uh, that had been proposed. Uh, this yellow and green line that we've shown here, this is the current alignment that has been proposed for many time, uh, for a while now. It was part of the Upper Displains Phase Two project, and this is the proposed design features uh, to add sheet pile to the existing. Groveland levy in the green area that would raise the height of that area by approximately two feet. Uh, the flood wall that would then be south of Forest Avenue, uh, it would be at elevation 618. It's about 700 linear feet of flood wall. It includes a closure structure for Forest Avenue itself. And then uh, we've also looked at 
uh, flood wall along park there to the north. Um, that was at the request of the board previously that had originally been suggested as a uh, road raise where we would just physically raise the level of the road. Uh, but having looked at the request of the board to look at a flood wall, we think that that's definitely manageable and, and presents a much better project overall. So next slide. Oh, I guess that one more click. There we go. Yeah. Oh, there yeah. So uh, this is kind of the more detailed look at the alignment of the flood wall itself. And this is the area south of Forest Avenue. This is the area where we were uh, most concerned with where the, fl the flood wall would end up being aligned with the property that is there. Uh, and so this alignment here is putting the flood wall on the very edge of all of the properties along West Avenue. Uh, so all these properties have an ending uh, boundary near the river, and this flood wall alignment is right on that property line at the very edge of their properties. Uh, so the flood wall itself is getting fairly close to the river in several locations, and you can see uh, this bottom box down at the uh, on, at the bottom shows uh, the elevation current elevation of the land. Uh, as the squiggly line that moves around, and then the flood wall itself at the top. Uh, this flood wall uh, represents uh, something in the neighborhood of about three to 10 feet, three to, I guess I take that back, three to about 11 feet in height above the current ground level. Uh, most of that is in the five to seven foot range, uh, as you can see from the height difference in the land. Uh, we do follow very closely to the river and there's a few places that it dips off quite a bit. And so we get a much higher flood wall in certain locations. Uh, that does that line there does represent the 618. And this again follows the back edge of the property line of the homes along West Avenue. Uh, the next slide. Uh, we wanted to take a look at if there was a way to possibly minimize some of the height of the wall in people's backyards. And so we decided, well, let's take a look at what we could do in terms of moving that wall a little bit further in, but hopefully not uh, being quite as imposing of a wall in terms of height in people's backyards. Uh, the terrain in the area where we move this, uh, where we, we see the greatest benefit is there at the very end as you get closest to the railroad. Um, so on the far left over here, you see that that 11 foot jump that we saw in the previous one is no longer there and it's more along the three foot height. However, we don't gain much else uh, further along the flood wall at all. It still is a five to seven foot wall in most lo locations. Um, so we don't gain a lot of change. In fact, uh, the alignment as we go from that uh, point in the middle there, there's a, if you go up a little bit with the arrow, um, go up into the, uh, yeah, there's a little uh, line going out into the river there. From that point to the left is what changed and from to the right, nothing changed at all from the, the previous slide. Um, so only that, that part headed towards the railroad from that line there, from between those two lines, that's the part that changed alignment slightly. Um, and so we did find there was a little bit of difference, um, but it's not a huge difference in and a lot of the backyards, you know, we still have a wall that's four and a half to five feet tall in most cases and up to seven feet in other locations. All right, so next slide. So what we did is we went out and we took some pictures in the area and we tried to kind of uh, do what we call superimpose a, a wall on those pictures to kind of show what it might look like if you were to see it constructed in the future. And these aren't exactly to scale. Um, some of this uh, doesn't have exact scale to it, but it kind of gives you an idea of what it might look like. So this is a picture taken from the far side of Forest Avenue, looking at the back side of the properties along West Avenue. And that gray line there in the middle of the picture is what would possibly be uh, what a wall might look like. 
the, the color of that gray is just uh, a gray that we had out of Photoshop that kind of represents concrete. Um, but again, that could be something that we would look at in our design process. Uh, we talked earlier today about the possibility of shading the concrete with dye uh, to make it look to whatever type of color that we would want to. Um, so that's one of the things that we'd be considering as we go into this. But as you're coming across the bridge, if you're walking on that side of the bridge, this is, might be what you would see approximately. Our next slide. So this is looking down one of the driveways on West Avenue. I believe it's one of the uh, multifamily units. And this is what the wall might look like towards the end of that driveway. Um, you see that it's cuts across the backyard there. Um, and note that uh, that tree there, uh, we removed that from the picture as well to, to more accurately represent the, the 15 foot setback from the wall uh, that would be required for woody materials. And we'll touch on that again later as well. Um, so that's what the wall might look like in that area. Our next slide. Uh, this is another picture headed across the backyard of several properties there along West Avenue. Uh, you can see we did try and put some texture to the wall uh, to show that we could have uh, a form liner for the concrete that would make it look more like a stone wall or something like that. That texture can vary based on the form liner that we have and we'll again uh, address that later in this presentation as well. All right, uh, our next slide. Uh, this is a backyard along West, along West Avenue. And uh, this represents about the four and a half to five foot height wall and what it would look like from the backyard. Uh, it would cut across this person's backyard, uh, giving them, leaving them no access uh, to the shed in this deck. Um, most likely would end up in removal of those, those features. Uh, so we did that in this picture where we uh, photoshopped out the deck and the and the wall and the shed to include the wall. Uh, next slide. And this is as we're getting closer to the railroad through the property. Uh, this wall is probably a little taller than what it would be uh, in general in this area. Probably a little bit shorter than that, uh, but it gives you an idea of what it would look like and where it might cut across through the property. Of course, that is kind of one of the details that we're working on still is where exactly on this portion uh, do we want to be out closer to uh, the river like we were in, in option one or option two where we'd be a little bit closer in towards the property as we're showing in this picture here. Uh, next slide. So this kind of gives you an idea again of the different types of flood walls. I think I've showed this before. The picture on the left is one that uses a form liner that makes it look like there it's kind of a rock wall that's made out of rock instead of concrete uh, so basically when you pour the concrete you have a liner on the form that gives it that look and it has some nice uh, uh, basically like fence post type features that that show uh, in between the segments of the wall kind of makes it look uh, not like a, just a regular concrete wall, but has some, uh, some definite, definite nice features to it. Uh, the picture in the middle uh, with the wooden fence and then the steel sheet pile, uh, you know, that's what just it would look like if it was left as bare sheet pile, what we're considering for uh, the Groveland Avenue portion of it. Again, that could also be covered with concrete. Uh, that we could also stamp and color as, as necessary. Uh, and then the, the far picture to the right is the final uh, version that is just more of a plain concrete wall. It's got a, uh, a fin to it that, that is partly uh, a type of form liner, but it's not as fancy as the stone that we see in the far left example. Uh, next slide. There have been several questions about uh, what a pump station might look like. Uh, we've talked about the fact that there's two outfalls that go through the flood wall. Uh, and this also gives you another example of what a flood wall could look like. So uh, the round structure in the middle 
of this first picture on the left, um, that uh, concrete with the little, yep, that one right there, where the arrow is, that actually is a pump station. It's basically just a concrete pipe in the ground. And then if you look at the picture on the upper right, um, it has two pumps in it on rails attached to uh, a pipe that then um, they pump out through that wall that you see on the picture on the left. And that picture on the left, that wall, uh, that is in displays, and that is a picture of, uh, again, an example of what you could do to the concrete to make it look more like a, a rock wall as opposed to just concrete. It has some nice relief to it, some different uh, size blocks and such like that. Uh, the silver cabinet on the right of that picture, that is the electrical that runs those sump pumps, and that is the main structure that you would see above ground besides that uh, cap of concrete on top of the uh, on top of the pipe that's sunk in. Uh, another example in the bot lower right hand corner, uh, again this is in displays. You can see there's just another concrete and two uh, two electrical panels that operate those pumps that are in the ground. So when we're talking about a pump station, this is a very minimal look to it. It can uh, it blends right in kind of and doesn't take up a lot of space. So uh, even though there isn't a lot of space available where we're looking to put the pump stations, we believe that these would be options that would be very viable for that. All right, so our next slide. Yeah, so this is where we get a chance to look at other considerations of what we've been talking about. Uh, so there's been several questions that have been presented about greenery and trees and the rules that the Corps of Engineers have enforced about uh, constructing flood walls and levees is that there's absolutely no woody vegetation within 15 feet of the foundation of the wall. Uh, with a concrete wall like this, the foundation usually doesn't extend too far out from the base of the wall that you see, um, but there are some that have slight lips that come out underground to help hold them, give them more stability uh, in the air. It depends on the height of the wall. We think that this wall we could construct without much of a, a foundation lip. And so you, you would basically see 15 feet from the base of the wall out on either side that would be free of all trees and woody vegetation. And that is a rule that is hard and fast. We cannot allow uh, trees or shrubs in that particular zone of uh, around any of our flood walls or levees. They do create uh, preferential pathways for uh, flooding to occur through those walls or to damage the walls themselves. And so that, that is one of the rules uh, that we would have to follow. Uh, we are allowed to plant grass and we would be able to consider native grasses and other plants uh, to be allowed within a zone, within that 15 feet, but we'd also need to make sure that we allow for proper inspection and maintenance to occur of that wall. Uh, so we do need to leave pathways on either side that would need to be maintained. Uh, every year, the Corps of Engineers partners with a local sponsor to come out and inspect each of these facilities that are constructed. We take the opportunity to go through, walk along the wall, note anything that needs to be uh, maintained or changed and give the chance uh, to work with the uh, local government to do that. So that is part of why uh, we have the rules about the 15 feet on either side. Uh, but we are willing to work on things like uh, prairie grasses and other possible plants that could be allowed within that zone, but still allow for operation and maintenance to occur uh, as well. There's also been many questions about FEMA certification. Um, the design height of 618 currently does not meet the FEMA certification standards. And we've been pretty upfront about that, it has not changed. Um, there has been questions, well, could we go to higher ground? Unfortunately, uh, the availability of higher ground, if we were to try and say shoot for 619, which may be closer to what would meet a FEMA certification standard, uh, means that we would have to extend the wall along Park Avenue uh, a lot further in order to even get to 619. Uh, we were able to complete a survey in that area. We thought that uh, the very far end of Park Avenue as it connects with Forest there would possibly give us a chance to reach 618. We actually have to go all the way across the street. Um, 
So we're going to have to work on what it is to get to 618 and have a, a some type of closure across that road that would involve um, most likely creating a small sandbag wall. Uh, that would be part of our operation and, ma operation and maintenance manual. Uh, so the city would be required to operate during a flood, uh, the building of some type of sandbag wall across the street so that we could connect with the six and 118 foot contour that is available across the street. Um, to go with that, um, you know, the FEMA certification, it's not completely off the table, uh, but we also have Illinois Bulletin 70 that was updated last year. Um, the Illinois Bulletin 70 is a rainfall bulletin. It basically dictates the design of all uh, water features of anything constructed in the state of Illinois. Uh, I believe they're gonna be calling it Bulletin 75. That's what we've heard, uh, but it's just an update to it. And basically it takes into account uh, climate change and uh, the more intense storms that we have been experiencing here in Illinois. And the rainfall amounts in Cook County did increase um, by quite a bit. And so we have started the process of updating the model for the Des Plaines River using the Bulletin 75 and the new rainfall. Um, the initial model update indicates that our that we have a higher 1% annual exceedance probability or what we normally call the 100 year flood level uh, in this area. Uh, this is not a definitive finding because uh, we are still going through a lot of process in terms of refining the model, making sure that it operates the way we want it to. We also have a lot of collaboration that we need to do uh, working with uh, MWRD, the state of Illinois, uh, the Illinois State Water Survey, uh, and eventually working with FEMA as well. Um, but it is uh, an indication that uh, when we say that it may not meet FEMA certification standards uh, in the future, as we look at how climate change uh, will impact uh, the, the water levels in, uh, in rivers in our area, that could definitely impact what a certification would look like. Uh, so at this point in time, we're gonna stick with our, our statement that FEMA certification standards are not gonna be met by 618. And it's really unclear how this would play out as we look at the future updates to the modeling that are occurring based on this new Bulletin 75. Um, just to go back again, the flood wall height from ground level, that's from that little squiggly line we talked about earlier. Uh, for option one, it varies from three to 10 or 11 feet, and most of it is between five and seven feet. When you look at option two, it's really from two to seven feet high most being in the four to seven foot range. So next slide. Here's our project cost. I really haven't changed this lately. Um, this is the same budget that we presented back when we started uh, over a year ago. Uh, project engineering and design still uh, just under 700,000. Uh, when we get to construction management, we'd expect about $300,000 in construction management. Uh, lands and damages and relocations adding up to about a million and a half and a construction project of about 4.7 million with total cost of 7.1 million, 4.6 being federal and two and a half coming from the non-federal cost share, which currently the Village of Riverside has a partnership with MWRD to cover those costs. Uh, next slide. So, so far we've received $500,000 from the federal government for the Corps to use in the design process. And we've gotten non-federal funding uh, through MWRD of 269,000, giving us a total funding of $769,000 available. Uh, what has been obligated and you actually used so far, uh, this is all on design efforts. Uh, what you've seen here tonight, developing those design drawings, developing the pictures, uh, walking through getting surveys, uh, holding meetings, et cetera, $130,479.64. Uh, so we still have almost $640,000 left uh, for design. That is through November 21st of 2020. So our proposed schedule, uh, we would hope to finalize alignment uh, decision sometime this spring, uh, which would get us uh, the ability to finish our 50% design. Uh, the wall design itself does depend on where it ends up on that, uh, uh, whether we go further inland or out closer to the river. 
Um, there's some areas where we may desire to move just a little closer in to ensure that we have uh, a wall design uh, that is easy to construct. Um, and we would definitely work with the village on that, uh, which decision would be made versus option one versus option two. Uh, then we, once we get to that and are authorized to move forward into final engineering and design, we'd look at 12 to 18 months, which would put us um, at least through spring of 2022, if not into the summer. We could then award a construction contract in the summer of 2022 with construction beginning that fall and winter uh, with about a, approximately a two year construction period ending in summer of 2024. Uh, next slide. And that's all I have for now on the update. So I'm ready to entertain any questions that you might have. Okay, thank, thank you, Jeff. So uh, before we open it up to generalized questions, I'd ask if any of the trustees have any questions for either Mr. Zucker? We also have with us this evening Orion Gailey, uh, the village, our village engineer from uh, Burke Engineering. So he's also available to answer questions. So uh, let's start with the village board first. Does, does anyone have any questions, Mr. Hannon? Yeah, I, I've, I've got three questions. And, and first of all, Mr. Zucker, thanks for the, 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 the presentation. It really I had about 15 questions and you knocked most of them off. So uh, thank you. All right. Um, the, the first question, I, I was intrigued. You mentioned, or I think you mentioned a Forest Avenue gate to, to yes. cover that. Could you give a little bit more detail on that and how that, that would be designed or worked or just worried about sort of the optics as, as you drive into town over the bridge and what, what would happen? Yeah, uh, so we have several different designs that we could look at. Um, we have uh, what we call a swing gate that basically would be, um, and we've looked at, at um, there's an area right there on Forest Avenue as you come up to the bridge, there's a little green space uh, off as you're driving over from Riverside into, I'm not sure what's across the river, as you're headed that direction. Um, there's a little green space off to the right. Um, and so that would be a perfect kind of quote unquote storage area for this gate. It could be what we call a swing gate um, that would be, there would be um, not a tall pillar, but a, a pillar of concrete that would have a metal um, gate attached to it that would store in that area and then swing around and drop down into the roadway and provide the uh, necessary height to reach 618 across that roadway. Um, we also have the ability to put in um, a sliding gate um, where we would have to construct uh, basically uh, a nice smooth concrete portion across that road and then the gate would be uh, stored again in that area to the right and you would it would have to be somehow manually pushed or with uh, some type of motor pushed across the road. Um, there's all types of gates that we could put in there, we would work with the, the village on that design and what it would look like. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, second question, I, I know um, that at one of the properties, there's drainage that comes from the street that goes out and, and that's really a cause of a lot of the backup um, that once that drainage gets overwhelmed, it starts going the other way. How does how is the the wall going to address you know that that particular problem? Yeah, that's a great question. That's where we are looking at putting in pump stations at those two. Like we have identified with the village those two pipes that they never normally shut off and cause a lot of that backflow. And so our proposal would for the wall is to install those pump stations like the ones that I showed you. They would then have a pipe that goes out through the wall and would be able to eject that water uh, using pumps instead of having to shut those pipes off. And, and those pumps would be operated by the, the village or, or the yes. water reclamation? Uh, those would be by the village as okay. the uh, the signatory on the project partnership agreement. Great. And then last last Mr. question, Hannah. and this, this is more of a, um, I guess, safety issue is you know, I know there's still a decision on how close the wall is going to get to the water line, but some of the residents have expressed concern that, you know, that behind the wall becomes a, a spot where, you know, 
kids gather to mm. uh, smoke, drink, hang out outside of the view, and and just wanted to get a sense of you know how much ground will be behind. And obviously, it's it's the village's issue to to probably police that, but just want to see from your perspective in design, you know what could be done to sort of minimize you know having the uh, West Suburban uh, Party Beach going on. <laughs> Jeff, yeah. before, you, before before you answer that matter, Jeff, just a second. Um, and Jessica, I'm going to address this to you or Sonia. I've just received a text from Mr. Uphughes that uh, our video feed seems to be frozen. So if, if one of you could check with uh, Riverside TV and see what's going on with that, I'd appreciate it. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, what it looks like in the area as you get closer to Forest Avenue is we probably have about 20 feet or so of property beyond that's sometimes underwater, sometimes not. Um, you know, in the design of this wall, we'd have to look at what we would do in that area. We would want to limit access to it. We don't want people hanging out back there because that is dangerous. Um, so we'd want to make sure that we tie in pretty closely with the Forest Avenue Bridge and regulate in some way. Uh, if I remember correctly, there's a few fences out there anyways, uh, based on that I think what IDOT has, you know, there's some limiting factor to the access and we'd work with the village on what type of, uh, you know, fence would be there, how we'd attach it to the bridge so that it wouldn't be easy to get back there, but we'd still want to be able to get back there for uh, our operation and maintenance inspections. So we'll work with the village on that. And we think we could do something with, you know, some nice, uh, maybe a little bit of prairie grass or something that would fill it in a little bit, not leave it just a blank beach per se. Um, and we'll just work with you on access. Great, very helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other questions? Mr. Gallagos? Yes, thank you. Um, Jeff, here's a question for you. What happens if we have this horrible storm, which not only causes flooding, but also an electrical power outage what happens with those pump stations? Yeah, so in most cases, um, we what we do is we put on generator hookups on those pump stations, uh, and we would leave it up to the village um, to be able to provide that um, generator that would be able to drive out, hook up, and operate the pumps. Uh, the other option is to have a tow behind pump that you would come out and supplement with. Um, we know that it is a possibility. It is our hope that any power outage would be short, um, but those are things that we can try and design for, at least in providing the ability to provide backup power uh, to those locations. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Other questions from the trustees? So I'll throw it open now to uh, the other folks who are joining us here tonight. Uh, as I said, if you have a question, if you could please put your video on and so that I can see you or an alternative if you can just send a chat so that I can see who wishes to be heard. So I'm not seeing any questions from folks who are joining us. Going once. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, um, can you hear me? I don't, I'm not used to doing this. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. You can speak um, up a little bit, that would help. Okay. I live on Lincoln and, I'm, um, and I missed the very beginning of your presentation. So I'm not sure, um, all, all I know is that on Lincoln, when we get a flood, the street fills up, the sewer rises and once it starts bubbling out of the sewer, basements start to flood. And I heard the uh, mention about not being FEMA um, would have approved. So what I'm curious is, uh, would this affect the people on Lincoln as well? Um, and if they're not FEMA approved, does that mean everybody still has to have flood insurance? Or I, I'm, I don't understand what, the, what that will all mean, how it will impact us. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, sorry, I'm trying trying to orient myself to uh, Lincoln here. 
uh, it's just one street over from Groveland. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, you know, and uh, I'm, it's between park and forest. Got it. Okay. Store. Yeah. So, um, so when we talk about FEMA certification, um, what we're really talking about is relief from flood insurance. Uh, and so, when we get to a FEMA certification of a levy, you, what they require is that it has the 100-year level of protection plus at least a two-foot um, freeboard or uh, insurance policy, basically, um, at least for the Corps of Engineers. I think a lot of people have looked up the FEMA regulations for us in the past, and, and for most other entities, FEMA requires a three-foot level of freeboard. Uh, we have a close partnership with FEMA, and they allow us to do a risk analysis and propose a slightly shorter of around two feet. Um, we also have some new policies with FEMA that allow us to do a further risk analysis that could result in something a little less than two feet if, um, if everything worked out in terms of the risk analysis. Um, but that's something that uh, we would have to go through as we finish the design and as we get closer to dealing with uh, Bulletin 75. Uh, so really the only impact of FEMA certification is the fact that um, those being protected by the levy uh, would not see relief from flood insurance. Um, we have done this in the past. Um, it is something that uh, we've built levies to a lesser level in other areas. Uh, we have one in Liberty Villa States uh, that it's built to a 75 year level um, that has it has not been FEMA certified, but it has provided a, a lot of protection to those folks up in Libertyville Estates. Um, so it's something that we do do. Uh, we prefer to try and get you FEMA certified. It is definitely a benefit, um, but is not a guarantee in this case. I, uh, another question is, do I understand it right that on park, you're going to have from the water or from the, um, from the river going um, I'm pointing, going the wrong way, going uh, east on Park. Is yeah. that going to go, how far streetwise? Like Lincoln is the first street, and then, um, well, I don't remember what, Grove or? Yeah. So, so how far is that going to go? Yeah, so the flood wall will go um, be for all the way from Groveland, all the way to, I, I think I said this wrong earlier, to Woodside Road. Um, so just before Woodside Road is where it would end, it would, and it'd be, you know, kind of like a one to two foot wall at that point uh, at Woodside so, Road. So that would run along where there's uh, parking lot, diagonal yeah. parking now. Yes, the between plan is to the put the wall parking. in that blank area between the parking lot and the, the, uh, the fence that's there. Okay, so in the past, our, our impression has been that the water on Lincoln has come from, um, let's just say, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, but Maplewood, you Correct. know, come over Maplewood and then just come down Lincoln. And yep. so the theory is that that wall would prevent that? Correct. Okay, yep. and then what happens just from rainwater when, um, when the street fills, even if the, if that's, if that stops the water from coming from Maplewood, if the street just fills up, and the sewer fills up, um, will those pumps you're talking about, are those designed to keep the sewers empty so that the street will stay dry? Yes. Is that the theory? Yes, that is one of the calculations that we still have to finish in terms of sizing. Uh, I mean, our initial thought is that those smaller pumps would be sufficient. Um, we think that that kind of goes with the size of the pipes that we have been told are out there, um, but we would have to double check those calculations and make sure um, of course, if it requires bigger pumps, then we end up with bigger structures. Um, so our desire would be to keep it small so that it has a place that we can easily put it. But we also don't want to leave you guys with a lot of rainwater in the street either. So the idea behind the pump stations is to be able to remove that rainwater from behind the flood wall and get it back into the river as it would normally flow. Um, so that's why when we build a flood wall, we put pump stations in. We want to that water would normally flow into the river. Instead of doing that, it's going to get collected in your street, uh, your street stormwater collection system. And then those pumps will pump it 
in this case, through the wall uh, out into the river itself. Even if the river is at a, a really high level, the water can go, it can get into the river without backing up and coming back in. Yep. So what we do is we put the pipe uh, out through the wall at a very at, at a at a level that's normally not covered. Uh, we make sure that it outlets into the river itself and that there's riprap there to prevent erosion and such. Um, and then we also um, put a flap gate on that so that there's no water can back up through it. Uh, but the pumps would overcome any pressure from the river itself and push the water out through that flap gate. So yep. in theory, then, once this is accomplished, the, when there's a heavy rain, Lincoln should be relatively, not dry, but not, not a swimming yes. pool. That, that would be the plan, that there would not be accumulation of water behind the flood wall, uh, that the pump stations would take care of that and help the the sewer, the stormwater system that's there, remove that water and get it out to the river. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thanks for your questions. So the next uh, questions we have are from Patrick. So pa Patrick, if you could unmute yourself and uh, if you want to join us with video, that's fine. Uh, and you can ask your questions to Mr. Zuber. Yeah, so um, sorry, my video isn't working on, on this computer. Um, can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. thank you. Okay, great. Um, so <coughs> one of my questions is where will the... Um, these pump stations be located and about how uh, large are they going to be? Because it looks like uh, they'll be on uh, our property side of the wall. And already with uh, one of the one of the drawings, the second one, um, it showed the wall being in fairly pr pretty far in the yard, which would uh, give us a very small backyard. Um, so I'd like to know well, where, where will those pump stations be located? How big will they be? Also, right above where those um, proposed flood walls are gonna go are the overhead electric lines. So what would happen with those? Yeah, so let's start with the pump stations. So really what we're looking at is there's one pipe that runs along Forest Avenue. And so we'd be looking for some location in the right of way along Forest Avenue to put in a pump station. Um, those pictures that I showed earlier in the presentation, um, those are really like a four, three to four foot uh, a round concrete pipe that's sunk into the ground, basically like, uh, um, what would you, I mean, it's just a round circle in the ground, basically. Uh, and the cover, you know, sticks up between one and two feet above the ground. Um, so we'd be looking for somewhere in the right of way along Forest Avenue to place one of those um, for the first part. And then um, the other pipe is, I believe it's somewhere near the intersection of Pine and West Avenue, and then heads out between two properties down there towards the river. And so again, we look at something uh, near West Avenue uh, where there would be right of way from, from the street itself and put that in, um, or maybe possibly out near the wall. Uh, we could put it in the 15 foot easement that would be required um, and have it closer to the wall. It just depends on what works out best uh, in the final design. So that would be um, that one. Uh, as far as the electrical overhead lines are concerned, um, we will have to coordinate with ComEd uh, regarding where those poles are. Um, it will be something that we'll have to work around in, in terms of construction. Uh, driving sheet usually requires some overhead equipment. We don't want it running into the electrical wires. Uh, so we'll have to coordinate with ComEd in regards to if those uh, wires either need to be re to be moved uh, somewhere else. Um, once the wall is in place, uh, they would not interfere with the wall in any way, shape, or form. It'd just be during construction. Uh, so we may have some uh, work with ComEd in terms of temporarily moving those wires uh, in, into a different location, or uh, we'll have to see what, what we can come up with. Yeah, because, um, well, my, my concern with that aspect is there's this big wall in my yard now, which is much closer to my house, along with a 15-foot um, right-of-way, easement, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and then above that is a bunch of wires. So there's 
no view at all out the back except this concrete wall and wires. It's just, it's, it's not pleasant and it's gonna really kill my property value. So our, our next uh, was were those, I think those were all the questions Patrick had. Our next question is from uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Hi, can I be heard okay? Very well. Okay, thank you. Um, so over a year ago, when this was last talked about publicly, uh, residents had a number of different uh, suggestions, which for each of them, the core was saying it was not sufficient. Each of these was not sufficient. Um, but things that in aggregate may have an impact on essentially the, the height of the wall that may be needed. Um, and I'd like to talk about a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, question of where the water goes. I know the core says it's not being sent down river, but the first thing is we already have a backup because when the core notched Hoffman Dam, they choked the river back up with the fill. And if that river was actually allowed to find its natural course, it would be flowing more freely and we wouldn't have as much backup. Um, we also have the issue that the village has ceased pumping its wells and we have saturated ground um, so that that cannot absorb uh, excess. Uh, during flooding, and I'm wondering if anyone is looking into the idea of actually, and it, this goes to problems that throughout the village with people's basements and the like, so it's even beyond the, the flooding, um, you know, having it so that the, the soil can, um, is, is not so saturated and can actually absorb uh, flooding as, as it should be. Um, Another thing is there's a disused uh, property on Groveland that the owner cannot build on and cannot raise the, the grade, uh, but maybe that's something that can be acquired and turned into a catchment. Um, and, you know, the idea of the streets being completely dry I don't need to have the street completely dry. I don't need to have my yard completely dry. I just don't want it coming to the building. Um, and I, I think that's that's the biggest thing is people don't want it coming to their building. And because my perspective of, you know, if the, if the streets are flooded and my front yard's flooded, uh, but it's not touching my prop, my, building that's fine i also wonder you're talking about raising the roads and i would want to know what kind of calculation there might be if we actually lower the streets and create those as a catchment so that they can hold more water um, as opposed to having it go up towards our our buildings um, and I'm glad to hear that you're willing to do something other than a hundred year flood. I mean, I understand hundred year flood is standard practice, um, but it is actually arbitrary. Um, and if we can meet what we need as far as the protection of the buildings with something, if it's 85% um, and then you don't have to go up to seven foot walls. I, I think that uh, especially with the probability that we won't get FEMA certified anyway, um, you know, if we can do 80 something or whatever the calculation is, still protect our buildings and not have to ha have as much of an eyesore as being proposed right now, uh, I think that would all be uh, useful. Um, 
Let's uh, let's let Mr. Uh, Zucker. There, there's a lot you, you put a lot. Yeah. Out. Let, Understood. Let's let Zucker respond, please. Yeah. So as far as uh, permeability of the ground and really uh, allowing the ground to soak up more water, uh, I mean that would be the desire to allow the ground to soak up this water. Unfortunately, it's not um, the ground that's the problem. It's all the impermeable pavement and buildings that uh, society has put up in all of Cook and Lake County. Um, that's what leads to this flooding. Um, there's a lot of areas that are do allow the water to infiltrate as much as possible, but it's still just not enough to overcome all of the improvements that have been made to the land itself. Uh, in terms of making it viable for us to use as a modern society. So, uh, you know, it, it is important to be able to allow the ground to uh, absorb as much of the water as possible. Uh, and the Corps is working on projects. We have a lot of ecosystem restoration projects throughout uh, the Chicagoland area that are trying to improve water infiltration in those areas. And we are continuing to work on those and we'll continue to do that. Unfortunately, the amount of development that has occurred in this metropolitan area just does not allow us to get to the point where, where that would overcome what has happened in terms of runoff that is created from all of our roads and buildings. So great idea. <clears throat> in terms of keeping the streets dry, I can't guarantee it'll be 100% of the time, even with the pump stations, but we want to do our best. Uh, we want to still allow you guys to drive on those. Uh, but in some ways they do act as kind of a little bit of a catchment. Um, the amount of water that they hold seems like a lot, but unfortunately it's just not um, enough to overcome what is needed uh, through the flooding that occurs in this area to protect the homes of Groveland and, um, and of Lincoln and other areas there. So, um, so it's a great idea, just there's not enough room there to hold that much water. Um, one property is is a good idea, but again, uh, the amount of water that you can hold on that property is just minimal compared to what the amount of water that roars by here in the river. So, um, so it really would take a couple hundred acres and a couple feet of water on a couple hundred acres to be able to uh, lower the the <clears throat> to store the amount of water going by. Um, and, and really, we've looked at that up and down the river, trying to find a storage location that could be sufficient to remove enough water from the river and lower it so that we wouldn't have to build flood walls and levees. Um, but really, that in this suburban area does not exist. Um, there's just not enough property, um, and it's, it, there's just too much water. So it's something we've looked at, and we really wanted to try and be able to do. Um, but unfortunately, it just there isn't the room available. Everything's been developed and there's just not a space for it. I'd, I'd like you to address the Hoffman Dam issue, the fact that that is choked back up and it is a not allowing the free flow, or it has not been allowed to create mm -hmm. the natural, reestablish the natural flow of the river uh, in, in our area at all. Yeah, so the removal of the Hoffman Dam was, uh, was an Army Corps project that uh, has naturalized the, that area as much as possible. Not um, true. Removing the dam did allow it to seek its normal level, um, and it did have some minor flood benefits. Um, we have documentation that there are a much greater native fish species uh, that are moving up and down the river now. Um, we have IDNR uh, studies that have indicated that, and they have indicated that it is a much healthier river because of that action at this point in time. I understand it is much healthier, but the river was choked back up with all of that fill that was put in. There's no denying that when you keep adding you didn't and put adding. any fill in there, actually. All of that, uh, that sediment that is in there was already there. That's not already talking. accumulated there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step in here. We're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna this evening. We're not gonna relitigate the, the Hoffman Dam issue. We're here to talk right. about the Groveland project. Okay, I'll just add, add one Maybe thing. One and, thing please. Okay, I'll, I'll just do one wrap up. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it would be important to see what can be done other than the hundred year 
flood since it sounds like it's not likely that we'll get FEMA certified anyway and that won't change anything. Um, and uh, to, to see how that might affect what the aesthetic of this is because the previous conversation was that they had to do the 100 year flood. So I'm happy to see that that's different. And um, I, when um, my, my other point was that I don't, I don't think dry streets is the goal. I don't think dry streets is, is a goal here. Um, and I, I think that people need to, to think about that. It's not about the, all of the properties staying dry all the time. And you can't out engineer nature. So we have to work with it as much as possible, not against it because nature wins ultimately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not seeing any other additional questions on uh, my chat feed here. Would anyone else, does anyone else have questions for either Mr. Zucker or Mr. Gailey before we move on to public comment? Okay, seeing none, well, thank you very it much. It looks like Adriana has a question. She's raised her hand. Ah, okay, I didn't see that. Adriana, please. Wait, wait. Okay. This is her husband, Wayne Lucas. I would just want to mention, is it good to build in a factor of safety when you build a wall, say with attrition, as the permeable surface of ground might get worse uh, from here down the river, where um, it'll be good to maintain that preventative nature of the wall into the future years to come, the better we uh, uh, do our work in making that happen, the longer the benefit will be. Yeah, I, I think that's part of why we're still looking at 618. We may not be able to get FEMA certification at that level, um, but given the future uh, of climate change and how we could see more intense storms uh, more frequently and the flood levels could change, we would wanna try and build um, a wall that still provides a high level of protection. Uh, even though it may not provide that relief from the flood insurance, it would provide uh, the highest level of protection that we think we can build for you. Um, and that would hopefully have some insurance level to it in terms of having uh, a height that is above what we think would be a 100, 100 year flood level, but yet might not still reach that FEMA certification level of building. So, okay. so we wanna try and maximize that as much as possible um, and see what we can do to help protect the people. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks, sir. Anyone else with questions for Mr. Zucker or Mr. Gailey before we let them leave us for the evening? Only once, twice. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zucker. Thank I'm you. Sorry, Richard Rankin has a comment. Okay, Mr. Rankin. No. Hi, thanks. I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that the current berm um, for the 30 years that I've been here is never overtopped. Um, we've had some pretty intense uh, floods that I've experienced. Jeff, is that at 612? Uh, that is at 616. 16. Okay. So for those who are measuring the differences and, and trying to get, get an idea where the current one would be as it relates to the old one, which has never been breached. Um, just thought I'd, I'd bring that in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rankin. Anyone else with questions? We're still gonna have public comment after this. So if folks have things that they just want to say, there'll be an opportunity for that. But if you have questions right now for Mr. Zucker or Mr. Gailey, now's the time.
think that's it. Mr. Zucker, Mr. Gailey, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Have a great evening. Further, further conversation. So now we'll move on to uh, public comment. If there are folks here who have things to say either on this issue or other issues, if you'll physically raise your hand, not, not the hand on the Zoom, because I can't look at both at the same time. But if you can physically raise your hand, I'll call on you and you can have your say. Does anyone have anything they'd like to comment on? Ms. Patterson, please. Uh, yes, I, I sent an email to you not knowing if I could be on the call, but I would be happy to just share that myself if, if that's all right. That'd be wonderful. So I live at 19 West Avenue. It's a tiny duplex and I recently experienced flooding in May. I will just read what I wrote. Um, there are several reasons I support this project. One, while this most recent flood didn't cause catastrophic damage to my home, the next one might. I live in a very small duplex and all my utilities are located in the basement. In a more severe flood, I would lose my furnace, water heater, washer and dryer, and electricity. And without electricity, I also wouldn't be able to pump out the water. Two, flood insurance doesn't cover everything, including mold remediation. Even after this recent flood, I experienced mold growth in my crawl space, but the deductible I have is high, and the improvements I need to make to treat and prevent mold growth wouldn't be covered. This creates an un unhealthy living environment for me that is not easily or affordably fixed. Three, the attached unit takes in even more water than mine because it's on the corner. And even though I pumped out my own basement, I experienced a constant flow of water through the wall from the other unit. Since I can't coordinate efforts with that unit, it's impossible for me to adequately reduce my own risk. Four, in addition to paying for flood insurance annually, I now have a storage rental of nearly $200 a month since I can't keep anything of value stored in the basement or crawl space. During this last flood, I was fortunate to be able to move all my valuables to the upper floors before it got bad, but I used up every square foot of space doing so and could barely move around my house for days while I waited for the waters to recede enough to bring in a truck and move things out. If a worse flood happened, it could easily leak into my first floor as well, and there is no way I could salvage my furniture or other personal items. It would be a devastating loss. Five, finally, because of the flood risk, my property value will virtually never increase. There are very few improvements I can make to my property to make it more valuable, but because of potential flood damage, I may have to make repeated costly improvements over the years. So that is my support of this project and how it would really change my life as a homeowner and resident of Riverside. And I hope that the village will move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. And, uh, and thank you also for the photographs that you sent along with your correspondence to the village board. Uh, it's, it's very helpful when we can hear directly from people like you who have, have you know, suffered repeated losses from these floods. So thank you for that. Anyone else like to comment? Mr. Lenetsky? You're muted, sir. Yeah, no, I'm um, in agreement with Michelle um, on Lincoln. We've, you know, all the damage she's had in her basement, we've had the same thing and it happens over and over again. You know, I'm, you know I've, I've been here 16 years and I think I've had five feet of water two years and, uh, you know, appreciable less water, but a lot of water more than that. And when I bought the house, the seller said, oh yeah, well, it floods once uh, every hundred years and we had the flood and you're good to go. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go, it's more like it now. So, um, you know, I just agree. I think if anything that could be done that would keep the water, and, and once again, the water doesn't have to be empty on Lincoln. It just has to 
you know, the sewer has to be moving, water in the sewer has to be moving fast enough so it doesn't come back into the houses because that's where everybody's getting it from the sewer, not from the, uh, you know, as much for as from the street. That's probably, that's all. So I agree with her. I hope you pass this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Other comments, please? Depending on my other eyes here too, to see something if I don't see it, so. Ms. Sandoval has sent a message in saying she's very much in support of this project. Thank you. Well, not, not seeing anyone right now, we, we do have, we, the board has received a number of um, email communications this week that have been asked to be read in as public comment. So uh, I don't know, Ms. Francis, are you going to do that for us? Yes, I am. There are and many of them, so. And, there, and there'll be time after this, uh, if anyone changes their mind and would like to comment. Thank you, sir. Dear trustees, the purpose of this letter is to encourage you to vote for the flood control measures proposed by the US Army Corps of Engineers. My family and I have lived on Lincoln Avenue for the past 20 years. Being first time and naive home, home buyers, I remember our realtor's words. The house is in a floodplain, but has not flooded since the berm was built. So just buy the flood insurance and then drop it after the first year. Shame on us for not doing proper due diligence. So I'm, I'm doing what I can so others do not have to experience what we have been through. Below are my reasons why this measure should be supported. And this resident provides um, a graph in which shows the historical crests. Um, back in the 1940s, there was one, 1950s, three, 1960s, three, 1980s, three, 1990s, two. From 2000 to 2009, there was one. And from 2010 to present, there are, have been nine historical crests. Nine historical crests above eight feet, which is when park areas start to flood in the past 10 years compared to nine historical crests in the previous 50 years. Historical rainfall events are increasing due to the changes in our climate and the impact at the local level is notable. Mixed residential housing stock means impact of flooding events are not always captured 100%. The Village of Riverside has greatly improved the communication to residents about a historic flood event and the National Weather Service real-time data feed is an invaluable tool for residents to track and assess next steps to protect their residences and families. It is these challenging times that the community of single family home residents and non-renters alike truly come together to help move belongings care for each other's children, share meals, and also help the elderly who live amongst us. Unfortunately, all of this comes at the same time with full knowledge that no matter how much prep work is done, the day or two before the flood, there is always the weeks of cleanup that come after. I have heard stories from renters who either missed the memo were not aware they were at risk or simply not at home to to return home and all of their precious belongings have been saturated in a feed of river water. It is heartbreaking to see these individuals who could not afford to lose anything, lose the majority of their items, while at the same time, we are incurring losses of our own. The renters only receive assistance if the event is declared a federal disaster zone. And even then it does not make them whole and they move elsewhere shortly after the flood as their former home will not be habitable for an extended period of time. While many residents complain of flooding in their basements due to improper drainage, lack of overhead plumbing or other factors that can be mitigated, we are fortunate that our home remains dry. The only time we flood is when the river is in our street encroaching down our driveway and the hydrostatic pressure in the ground causes water to come through hairline cracks in our foundation. Over the 20 years we have lived here, we have spent tens of thousands of dollars on flood insurance, landscaping, portable water barriers, 
numerous pumps, four generators, three furnaces, two water heaters, and countless other flood mitigation and flood cleanup efforts that were not covered by flood insurance. We stay because we love our 112 year old home and the quality of life that we enjoy here in Riverside. Approving the Groveland Avenue levy brings a small piece of security as we encounter these drastic rain events that are happening more frequently. Your vote for the levy benefits the current homeowners, renters, and the children that live in this part of town as well as the generations that follow. Thank you for your time and consideration, Maya and Ryan Schultz. Dear trustees, my name is Teresa Sosa and I lived in Riverside for 18 years. I still own two properties in Riverside, 38 West Avenue, my previous home, and 40 West Avenue, a condominium I've owned since 2005. I want to voice my strong support of the Berm rebuilding project. My properties have flooded a few times and it was very difficult to get back to normal, but I love Riverside and do not want to sell. I believe most people have stayed despite flooding for the, this very reason. Please consider those of us who have stayed despite dealing with the flooding and who now are hoping to get some protection from future flooding. Teresa Sosa. Hello, thank you for all of your work regarding the Groveland Berm project. I know this is that it is complicated, time consuming and contentious. I will attend this Thursday's board meeting, but decided to write you to voice my support in case an opportunity does not arise during the meeting. My husband and I are both in favor of the berm, even though we will regret the loss of our view <clears throat> from our front room where we enjoy watching the wood ducks, great blue herons, egrets, and other water birds that migrate along the river each spring and fall. That will be a hefty price to pay, but it is worth it. The berm is of value, not just to our homes along the river, but also to Riverside in general. Every year when heavy rain, rains fall and climate change will exacerbate that, many new cha news channels automatically send people out to document the rising waters in Riverside and they station themselves on the corner of Groveland and Forest waiting for the spectacle. Riverside has become infamous, and this has a negative impact upon our town's image as well as our home values, which affect everyone. In addition, when the river actually breaches the bank and causes our homes to be small islands surrounded by water, it creates great expense to the village and places undue burden upon our police, fire department, public works and gas company, ComEd, etc. This time and money could be better spent elsewhere in the village. The personal cost is large as well. We have lived here for 34 years and have lived through four floods. FEMA declared us a disaster area four times. The financial burden is enormous, requiring new furnaces, air conditioners, water heaters, electric panels, etc., to be replaced. But the physical toll is greater because it takes a lot of effort to haul washing machines and dryers up and down as well as to clean and disinfect the basement walls after the water recedes. And although we've only been declared a disaster area four times, there have been numerous close calls, spring of 2020 being the most recent, where we had to drag everything up and down because it looked as though the river would surely come over. While we all appreciate dodging a bullet, racing around with washing machines and dryers is exhausting and creates a never ending psychological burden even when the basement stays dry. From my point of view, there are many reasons that the berm would be beneficial to Riverside. However, I will be interested and open-minded about the Army Corps' final study. If they deem it unnecessary, so be it. I will bow to their greater understanding of, of the science of the project. In the end, they are the people with actual knowledge and expertise, and I trust that. We can have our opinions, but we should listen and respect what the experts say. I remember when the notching of the Hoffman Dam was being debated, many of our Maplewood neighbors claimed with absolute certainty that if the, dam was, if the dam was notched, their river walls would crumble, the river would dry up, and only great muddy smelly puddles of breeding mosquitoes would be left. None of that came to pass, but they were convinced, offering no science or evidence, that they knew 
what would happen. I hope that this time everyone will take a more respectful view of what the engineers and experts have to say. Thank you, Fran and Carlos and Cantara. President Sells and Trustees, I write to you today in regards to the Groveland Avenue levy project the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would like to facilitate to lessen the risk of flooding in our homes and businesses. At the front of our mind of at the front of mind are the many houses and buildings prone to more frequent flooding over the past few years and what this kind of project can be for those residents. Improved quality of life and finances cannot be understated. But this is a project that also benefits the entire Riverside community. We all utilize businesses that are in the direct line of floods. We travel the streets that floods might temporarily close. We'd hate to see any of those temporarily closed or damaged to the point of requiring a longer term shutdown. And flooding doesn't just affect Riversiders, flooded streets and businesses make it more difficult or impossible for visitors from other places to come here. All businesses suffer when that's the case. This levy project is one of the one of those rare of opportunities to improve our community paid for by a government body other than our own. I hope you will continue to push forward with this project. Thanks much, Nilsa Sweetser. My name is Elizabeth Ryan and I'm the owner of the three flat, three flat located at 101 Lincoln Avenue. I am in support of the Groveland Levy project. I purchased the building with my sister prior to being placed in the floodplain through rezoning the area. We have been dealing with this issue since the first major event in 2008 and have suffered financial losses. We need help dealing with future floods. I wanted to send you my feedback for consideration on a boat. Sincerely, Elizabeth Ryan. President Sells and Trustees, I am writing in support of rebuilding slash extension of the Grove Limber. My family has lived on Lincoln since 2006. In that time, we've experienced many different types of flooding events with various amounts of water in our basement. Because our house is over 100 years old, we have a rather, rather porous foundation. With a sudden heavy rainstorm and or extended periods of rain, we often get seep water seepage in our basement. This happens three or four times a year. With longer periods of rain and or particularly have heavy storms, the storm sewers in the street can't handle the rate of the flow and the street will begin to flood. This causes water to backflow into our basement from the drain stack. At this point, we need to bring out our utility pumps and dry vac. Also at this point, we begin to think about moving the contents of our basement upstairs. This has happened numerous times since we have lived here. The next level of water problem is all hands on deck. This kind of event happened just this past May. The river level was very high. The street was flooded. The water was backing up into the, our front yard and approaching our house. Water was backing up through the drain pipe. The water pressure underground was so high that water was coming up through the basement floor and walls. Our sub pump was running almost continuously. Our utility pumps were out and running continuously. We had towels in various places around the basement absorbing water. We were continuously pushing the water with brooms closer to pumps so it wouldn't accumulate in puddles around the basement. In the middle of all this, we had to carry all the boxes and contents of our basement up to the first floor. The worst of this all started around 6 p.m. in the evening. We are up until about 5 a.m. the next morning, continuously pumping water, exchanging towels, removing water with the dry vac, and helping our neighbors when we could. Had we not stayed up through the night, our basement would have filled with water. Had we not been home or had the electricity gone out, our basement would have filled with water. This, of course, would have meant an entirely different type of event. This all hands on deck event has happened four times since we lived here. 
The entirely different type of event I mentioned above has happened twice since we've lived here. So twice in almost 15 years, once in September of 2008, and, and again in April of 2013. This is when the river overflowed its banks on both sides of the current berm. We were busy then performing the above tasks, but once the river overflowed its banks, water began pouring into our basement at the point where the foundation meets with the timber construction. Our basement filled with over five feet of water in about 20 minutes on both of those occasions. At this point, we had to pack our suitcases, gather our small children, and try to figure out what to do next. We had to move out of our home for about a, a week both times. Although the berm project will not fully address the various flooding problems we experience, it will address the most severe, costly, and disruptive issues. When I review the list of current historic crests in the Displains River at Riverside listed on the NOAA site, website, six of those crests have occurred since we lived here. For some reason, the crest in May of 2020 is not listed, so really the count should be seven. This seems to be rather straightforward evidence that these types of events are occurring more often and are likely to continue to occur into the future. Overbuilding slash urbanization, lack of adequate stormwater drainage systems and upstream water treatment facilities will continue to impact the river level here. I personally believe that climate change will continue to increase this impact as well. Several weeks ago, I viewed the interviews posted for our village trustee candidates. They all mentioned their thoughts on for the future of our village. Almost all of them said something specifically about wanting to ensure that Riverside remains a viable community for many, many years to come. I feel the Groveland Berm rebuilding project is critically important to achieve that goal. Therefore, I respectfully ask for your vote in favor of this project. Thank you for your time and consideration, Lisa Garay. Getting close. Hello all, my name is Romney Cirillo and my fiance Jeanette and I have lived at Groveland, 95 Groveland Avenue since the summer of 2017. I wanted to reach out personally to give some thoughts and concerns regarding the river and berm along Groveland. We attended the town hall meeting sometime last year when the Army Corps presented information on rebuilding the Groveland berm to address the continued flooding issues. I took the opportunity towards the end of the meeting to introduce myself and the concerns we've had since living in our home this short period. We have gained a vast amount of information through our wonderful neighbors and other residents living along the river the past three years. Even though we did not experience the horrible flooding in 2013, we have had a handful of close encounters with the river. This past May being the scariest as river levels rose higher than they did when it crested in 2013. Many people throughout Riverside and Chicago experienced horrible flooding within their homes. Our neighbors and, and we had the additional burden and worry of the river cresting, potentially making the situation much worse. It was the first time we also experienced relocating our vehicles and being directly directed by police and fire staff to evacuate our homes if needed. Through the frustration, our encounter with the firemen on the street was extraordinarily positive and supportive. They even assisted in carrying hoses and pumps I was attempting to bring back to remove water already accumulating within our and our neighbor's basements. During the meeting last year and in an email to Ben Sell shortly after that, I mentioned how we are thrilled to live in Riverside. I am honored that my company has begun working on various projects throughout town, such as our mirror pond renovation at the Coonley House. I am excited to continue offering our services to our other residents in the future. We love our home and plan to make many memories in it on Groveland for years to come. It's not only a matter of financial concern, but one of health and safety. We see our neighbor's kids playing every day in the front yards on our street and look forward to having those same moments with our family, with a family of our own in the future. I will leave the statistics and study facts for the others. My email gives our perspective and understanding of what 
we have already seen and experienced in our short three years of living on Groveland. We hope the board votes with a resounding yes to support the rebuilding of the berm. If our schedules allow, we will do our best this evening to show additional support by attending the town hall meeting through Zoom. Lastly, I want to thank you all for the care and professionalism I have seen and all the hard decision making brought to your table. Stay safe and happy holidays, Romney and Jeanette. I have two more. <clears throat> Thank you for your continued service to our village and local government. It is sometimes a thankless job and we are grateful to those who step up and volunteer their time to keep our village safe and running smoothly. We are writing to ask for your support of the Grove Limburn project. Our family moved to Riverside about five and a half years ago across from the river. We knew when purchasing our home that there was a possibility for flooding and diligently purchased the FEMA insurance necessary to protect our home. What we didn't expect is that we'd experience two flooding events in a short time here and for the FEMA insurance, deduct insurance to double. Both events were stressful and financially burdensome, but the latest one in May of 2020 was extremely worrisome. We were lucky enough to be spared the worst of the river's wrath that day. But in talking to the Army Corps of Engineers representative that was sent to inspect the area, we were informed that the current berm is already compromised and another event could further damage the safety net and quickly put our home underwater. I've been paying attention to the board discussions over this project and have found out that the discussion and subsequent stalling due to a vocal minority has been going for quite some time and across different elected boards. My question is, if we have the opportunity to complete a project that will help mitigate some of this stress and financial burden to our village, why shouldn't we pursue it? We can all see the effects of climate change and overdevelopment around the country, as well as in Riverside, and we know that these heavy rainstorms are becoming more common. The longer we drag our feet on putting measures in place that will ease some of the destruction due to a changing climate, the more residents in Riverside will, as a whole, suffer. I sincerely ask for your consideration of our situation and ask you to vote in favor of rebuilding of the Groveland Berm. Thank you for your time, Lisa and Peter Janonis. Hello trustees, I wanted to send a note with my thoughts of the possible Army Corps project to raise the Groveland Berm and extend barriers to the North and South. I'm in favor of moving forward with the next stages of the project to determine how it may be implemented. Obviously, I do not like the expected aesthetic impact of work, but in balance, I think that the reward for the community is great enough to accept that unfortunate cost. Also, for the greater good, I am willing, albeit reluctantly, to endure the many months of unearth pounding and construction required to execute the plan. I've lived on Groveland now for 30 years. My neighbor across the street is the Des Plaines River, so I've gotten to know this issue very well. My wife and I bought our house under the premise that the current berm had, had solved flooding problems in the area, but alas, it did not. Because the project wasn't extended on each end of the Groveland block, the water merely comes around the ends of the berm. The current berm is effective, however, for many close calls, that would have us under water often. This new project would complete what was left uncompleted many years ago. Our first 18 years here were flood free, but over the last decade, it seems that there are more and more close calls and flood events. Myself and my neighborhood seem to be enduring the hardship of floods at an increasing rate, likely due to looming climate change. It is this increase in events that reinforces my opinion that this project must be seriously considered. The river I moved across from in 1990 now exists in a very different macro hydrological or hydrologic system and will too in the future. In my rough estimate, there are about 550 folks, around 25 single 
homes and 25 multi-resident structures in my vicinity whose safety and property are at risk with each event. Also at, at risk, of course, is the safety of our village's fantastic fire, police, and public works professionals. Personally experiencing the 2008 and 2013 major flood events, I can attest to the great hardship and cost. You and the Army Corps know the actual dollar cost of the, for these floods. There also has been many close calls. One just recently in May of this year that required days of preparation, pumping, and cleanup. Thank you for exploring this possible project further and for all of your diligent work on behalf, on behalf here in Riverside. See you on the Zoom tomorrow. Best, Richard Rankin. That is it, sir. You're muted. I do at least once every meeting, so. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Hello, can you hear me okay? Who is that? My name is Chris. I live at 18 West Avenue and I am part of that um, vocal minority. And, and I think we're considered a minority because we happen to live on West Avenue, which is a short block. And kudos to the, the group that well coordinated all of their, their responses. And I understand everything you're saying and can appreciate what you're saying. And you have suffered losses. I'm very sorry for it. So have we. You have insurance that can cover some things that come up. I know you, insurance doesn't cover it all, but you know what? There is no insurance that covers the destruction of our property values with that wall that is going to go in our yard. That is a, a benefit that we have of living close to railroad tracks that are very loud, that we can enjoy the beautiful river. And I would at least like to be acknowledged by the large group that lives on Groveland and Lincoln and so forth, that you are asking us to do a huge sacrifice about our homes and our properties. Many of us have lived here um, 15 years or more. Consider that please, when you're deciding to vote on this, what's gonna to happen to us? We're a, we're a short street with just a few people on it. What is it, maybe 10 structures on this block. Our property values will be ruined. The many hundreds of thousands of dollars that we have all used to buy our houses over the years. Think about that. That's all I have to say, thanks for listening. Other comments from anyone before we wrap up public comment? Going once, twice. Okay, thank you everyone for, for uh, joining us on our Zoom tonight. We're gonna- I apologize, President Sells. I did get a message saying um, from Michelle Ritma saying she sent an email to the village manager and didn't hear it read aloud. Um, I don't, did she send it just to uh, manager Francis? Cause I don't recall getting anything from Ms. Ritma. I thought I saw it in the package that you sent, Jessica. I believe it is one of the ones that I forwarded to everyone. Let's take a moment while manager Francis takes a look. It was just overlooked. Kathy said it was in the, do you have it readily available, Kathy, where you can read it? I'm not finding it. I do have it. I can read it. Thank you. Um, it says, to whom it may concern, I want to reach out regarding the upcoming board meeting, specifically in regards to the presentation by the Army Corps of Engineers for the Groveland Avenue levy project. 
It is with utmost concern that I urge you and the fellow trustees slash board members to vote yes to approve the US Army Corps of Engineers to proceed with the Groveland Avenue levy project. We moved to our beautiful home at 91 Groveland Avenue in Riverside in September of 2012 from the city in hopes of raising our family in our forever home. We were attracted to the area due to the proximity to the city as well as the relative safety and sense of community Riverside has to offer. Shortly after moving, we experienced the flood in April, 2013. It was an extremely traumatic experience and it has forever changed our lives. We had to replace our entire first main floor due to the flooding damage while also trying to raise a five month old child. As you can imagine, there was quite a large cost to replace the material things, but the sense of safety that we lost and the constant foreboding every time it rains has never gone away. While we've since implemented mitigation measures, we are very aware of the potential for this to happen again, unless the city joins us in choosing options to help lessen the damage, both physically to the properties in the area, as well as mentally to the residents that have to deal with the fallout each time the flood waters rise. I ask that you please consider our family and the families like us that look to move into the downtown area of Riverside for their home and approve the vote for the US Army Corps of Engineers to proceed with their levy project on Groveland. Thank you in advance for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Michelle Reitman, Reitma, 91 Groveland Avenue. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Okay, hearing nothing further, don't think, All right? Okay, so we'll close uh, public comment and we'll move on with the remainder of, of our agenda. Uh, next up is the president's report. The only thing I have for you this evening is an application for a, a liquor license. On November 1st of this year, we received a liquor license application from uh, Gisela Munoz on behalf of Katrina Bar Inc. at 34 East Avenue in, in Riverside. Uh, they are asking for a Class E restaurant license, which is mixed drinks, which will allow them to serve alcohol in addition to beer and wine for consumption on the premises when provided as part of a food service. They have submitted the required documents and staff is reviewing them. A, Final, uh, the, the application is always contingent upon uh, submitting fingerprints and having a completed background investigation. So staff is recommending approval. So I would ask for a motion and a second to approve an ordinance authorizing issuance of a Class E restaurant liquor license to Katrina Bar Inc. I will make that motion. Motion by Mr. Gallego, second by? A second. Ms. Collins, any comments, questions? Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Gisa. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. The motion carries. Um, that's all I have for this evening, Manager Francis. I do not have a report this evening. We'll move on then to the approval of the, of the consent agenda. It is a fairly lengthy one, so bear with me here. Uh, item T, as in Tango, uh, has been asked to be removed by one of the trustees, so that will not be part of the consent agenda. So on the agenda this evening is to ratify the voucher list of bills for November 19, 2020, voucher list of bills for December 3, 2020, to approve the Village Board of Trustees 2020 Tax Levy Public Hearing and 2021 Budget Public Hearing Minutes of November 5th, 2020, to approve the Village Board of Trustees Regular Meeting Minutes of November 5th, 2020, and to file and review the following, Economic Development Commission Regular Meeting Minutes September 10, 2020, Planning and Zoning Commission Regular Meeting and Public Hearing Minutes of September 23, 2020, Police Pension Board meeting minutes of August 24, 2020, and disability hearing minutes of September 24, 2020. The Community Development Finance, Fire, Police, and Public Work Department's October monthly reports. 
the Village of Riverside Police Pension Fund Municipal Compliance Report for 2019. An ordinance adopting the 2020 property tax levies for the 2021 collection for the Village of Riverside and Riverside Public Library. Ordinances adopting the annual budget of the Village of Riverside and the Riverside Public Library for the year commencing January 1, 2021 and ending December 31, 2021. An ordinance abating the tax hereto levied for the year 2020 to pay the principal and interest on $2,250,000 general obligation refunding bonds, alternative revenue source, series 2010A of the Village of Riverside, Cook County, Illinois. An ordinance abating the tax hereto levied for the year 2020 to pay the principal and interest on $2,175,000 GO refunding bonds, alternative revenue source or water system, Series 2011 of the Village of Riverside, Cook County, Illinois. A resolution directing the reduction of the 2020 property tax levies by the Cook County Tax Extension Office, if necessary. A resolution waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the village manager to enter into various purchase orders. A resolution waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the village manager to execute a contract with Christie Weber and Company or not to exceed amount of $20,800 for the 2021 Central Business District planter bed maintenance. A resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a contract renewal and issue a purchase order to D. Ryan Tree and Landscape Service or not to exceed amount of $40,000 for 2021 cyclic tree trimming services. A resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a contract renewal and issue a purchase order to D. Ryan Tree and Landscape Service or not to exceed amount of $40,000 for 2021 tree and stump removal and emergency storm damage response. A resolution amending section 213 and 214 of the Village River of Riverside Employee Manual relative to work week definition. And a motion to approve the special event application for holiday hello with Santa to be held on Saturday, December 12, 2020. I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Collins. Second by. Second. Ms. Collins, please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. The motion carries. The item removed is a resolution approving and authorizing the use of municipal services associates for wireless facilities plan review services. I believe Mr. Hannon, you had some questions on that issue. Uh, just looking for some background on the uh, purpose of, of the uh, contract. I'll handle that, uh, President Sells. Um, so if the board recalls in 2018, the village adopted a small cell ordinance to establish standards related to design permitting location and construction of small wireless facilities also known as small cells and um, there was a zoning code modification with regard to placement of small small wireless facilities and with regard to small cells the village does not have any pending applications however this is our proactive approach that should we get any of those applications while well, director apt and director tab can review it for certain village requirements as it relates to making sure that aesthetically it matches our different designs um, and other poles that we have within the village and setbacks are required um, and whether different concealment and things of that sort um, looking at it from the technical perspective would be what municipal services associates would handle. They would make sure that it would be completed within the time frame that is required statutorily, um, and they would be able to give it that additional technical review that we do not have the expertise in-house. Um, as I said, I don't anticipate, we haven't received any yet. However, I do want to have the availability of this consultant should we need to utilize his expertise in the future. Great, that, that, that's very helpful and answers my questions. So with that, I ask for a motion and a second to approve the resolution. I'll make, I'll make a motion. motion. Motion by Ms. Evans, second by Mr. Galagos. Please call the roll. 
Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. We'll move on now to reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? Hearing none, we'll move on to, we do have a presentation this evening by the Landscape Advisory Commission Chairperson, Kathy Maloney, about uh, major activities for 2019 and 2020. Chairperson Maloney. Thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for letting me just give this brief report. Uh, you did have a copy of the report, I believe, in your material, so I'll just hit the highlights. Um, it's all good news. Uh, so it's been a very different year, as you know, but I think that um, the nature uh, that Frank, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted embedded into Riverside's design has helped many of us get through this year. Uh, as many of you know, Olmsted himself was the executive secretary of the Sanitary Commission in um, the Civil War and was therefore very familiar with infectious diseases and helped uh, develop the philosophy that uh, to cure both physical and mental health, one needed a lot of nature. So that is the, the effort of the Landscape Advisory uh, Commission. And in the past uh, year and year or two, we've been trying to do just that, is to preserve and steward the beautiful landscape that Frederick Law Olmsted designed for us and encourage residents and visitors alike to enjoy it. So we have two major charges in, the, um, in, our, in our charter, and that is to develop and um, preserve a, man, a master landscape plan. Uh, that plan was developed in 2015 and approved by the board. Uh, and then periodically on a cycle of about three to five years, uh, we look at the public green spaces throughout Riverside and compare it to what was described as the ideal uh, situation in the master landscape plan. So this year uh, and last, the areas that we decided to look at are what we call the signature triangles in Riverside which were essentially the major triangles that you see upon entering the village. So it's kind of the first uh, image that you get of Riverside uh, through all the uh, entrance ways that come into uh, our village. And um, essentially, and you'll see the results are, are attached at the end of this plan. Uh, we had you know, very good news. We just can't compliment enough the uh, Public Works Department and the Forestry uh, department for the work that they do. Um, those triangles that we did have uh, some issues with were mostly issues regarding invasive plants. And this is not something that um, the forestry department typically uh, has enough staff to look at on an ongoing basis. Uh, this is the ground level, the abrasious level. Uh, of plants. And so we uh, have been working with the forestry department to identify those triangles that have a lot of invasives and are trying to find uh, volunteer work days or scout projects who want to take that on. But overall, the assessment of 2019 to 2020 was very good on those signature triangles. Our second major charge is in uh, education and outreach. Um, we uh, were able to work with two uh, major scout projects. Our commissioner, Lisa Lambros, did that, uh, heads up that uh, area. One of the projects was to augment some of the uh, tags that are on the Arboretum in Guthrie Park. And another one was to do some um, uh, planting and invasive removal with the Girl Scouts uh, along the riverbank. So we're always open to volunteer groups like the Scouts uh, whenever they have Eagle projects or silver uh, awards to do. And uh, Lisa is very helpful in um, guiding that. Uh, another project that we took on, and I should mention that uh, some of these projects were uh, augmented financially by a green grant that was awarded uh, two years ago that we uh, 
one or two years ago, I don't quite remember, uh, that we worked with Public Works to secure. And uh, part of the reason that I'm presenting this today is I want to uh, give um, acknowledgement to uh, Open Lands and Commonwealth Edison for funding this. It was about six, six, $6,400 in total. Um, and one of the projects that we did was create backpacks um, that are housed in the Riverside Public Library. Uh, and these are projects for both, um, they can be checked out, they're for both adults and for uh, younger uh, family members. Um, they have to do with designing your own garden. So there's little toolkits where you can model your own garden. Uh, there's one that um, teaches how to actually do community design and another, another uh, backpack about nature journaling. There's 12 backpacks in all. And um, we're delighted that the library has agreed to um, house those for us. We did have plans to have some events around that. 2020 uh, precluded that, but we're looking forward to doing that next year. Um, Picnic Like It's 1869, uh, Commissioners Lauren Cody and Julie Schaaf, uh ha have been running that. Again, this year we could not do it, but the essence of that is it's held on Swan Pond Bluff. And it's uh, completely um, uh, recyclable, if you will. You uh, choose your lunch, you bring your own lunch uh, as you might have in 1869 with no plastics, no um, anything that would need to be um, cause waste uh, is not encouraged. Uh, and a lot of people have come in the past and we hope to do that again this year. Um, we created, with the help of uh, Gail McKernan, who's a resident in town, three posters, uh, Trees of Riverside, Birds of Riverside, and Wildflowers of Riverside. Uh, and uh, we have been giving those out as prizes for the various contests that we've held throughout uh, the past year with uh, photo contests and so forth. Um, the images on those photographs are all done by uh, Riverside photographers, amateur and professional and are all taken in Riverside. Um, so we have a number of those posters remaining uh, that we will be giving out uh, in this coming year, hopefully when uh, people are able to get together uh, much more so than they were last year. Uh, the Arboretum, uh, Commissioner Dave Rubin has been working with the Village Forester and our uh, contractor with GIS to uh, solidify and enhance the data that you can uh, see now on the um, uh, interactive map on the village's website. Uh, there, all the data has been updated and we are in the process of updating some images as well. Uh, in terms of the Arboretum, uh, Commissioner Mary Plunkett has worked to create a docent manual. Uh, we have training now for other people who want to be docents of the Arboretum. And we will be uh, including some additional tours this year, again, when we can uh, get people together outside. <coughs> so we're looking forward to that. <clears throat> um, we obtained with the use of the uh, green grant money, as well as some individual donors in Riverside, a binocular viewer, the sort of thing that you might see if you were to go to a state park uh, and look over the landscape and so forth. You can see a picture of it in the uh, packet that I gave. And that viewer will be positioned in the library uh, so that you can look at some of these uh, wildlife, uh, be it a bird or a plant or whatever along the river and the library has agreed uh, to um, uh, in, uh, install that in the, um, I always forget the name of it, but it's that beautiful patio that's on the main floor that's glass enclosed, quiet reading room. Uh, and uh, we'll have a, a little um, document along with that so people can know what they're looking for. Two other quick things. Um, Swan Pond, part of the green grant money went to maintaining Swan Pond. You may recall that that was a project uh, that the Landscape Advisory Commission was involved with along with many volunteers throughout the village uh, to try to figure out what plantings would work in this new environment that we're in that constantly floods or has drought or whatever. 
and a key element of that, which uh, we knew from the beginning, was that that needed to be maintained. Uh, so that's an area that we hope the village will uh, keep uh, its eye on, and, and we will keep our eye on it as well uh, to see how those plantings are doing uh, and to see what we can do for the south end uh, as well. And then lastly, <laughs> we will be updating a uh, homeowner landscape booklet uh, that will describe different ways that you can work with your landscape to um, make it eco-friendly as well as beautiful uh, and um, to give a, homeowners an appreciation of what the intent is for the land, public landscapes in Riverside. And uh, with the help of Riverside TV, uh, we're also putting together a video uh, of topics like that. And that video, as well as the booklet, should be coming out um, in January or February of next year. So that's what we've been doing. Um, again, we've been trying to encourage People, uh, they do, of course, appreciate the nature. We're just trying to give an extra um, ways that people can enjoy it. And um, we're very open to any suggestions you have of how we can uh, enhance some of the materials that we've created or anything that we do as a commission. So thank you for listening and um, take any questions if you have it. Any questions for Ms. Maloney? I actually have one. Uh, do you guys have any information in the pamphlets about the uh, type of landscaping that might help attract uh, birds to your yard? They're bird friendly. Yep. That would be in the uh, pamphlet that we're going to put out uh, in January. Okay. Thanks. That was, that, was, that was as a resident, not as a trustee. Yeah, know. yeah. I think you were asking that for Valerie. That's what I think. <laughs> I was, but she's hooked. I'm hooked. There you go. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, Ms. Maloney, thank you. The your commission has just been exceeding. All, I, just, just a second, Doug. Um, you've just been doing wonderful work. I've heard so many com, uh, compliments about how Swan Pond looks. Uh, it, it, every year, it, it gets closer and closer to being you know what it was and being the natural place that that it was really intended to, to be. And uh, under your leadership, your your commission is really is really thriving, and we really appreciate what you are all doing. Thank you. It's a great team, and thank all of you for letting us do our thing. Mr. Pollock, you had something. I was just going to say the same thing you just said, Ben. Um, I went through that report, and I was so impressed and so pleased with what I read. Um, to see this commission, which is so important to the village of Riverside, um, doing the kind of tremendous work that they're doing really, really made me feel really good about being involved in Riverside Village Government, to see volunteers stepping forward, doing great work for our village. So I wanted to express my gratitude and thanks to, uh, to the Landscape Advisory Commission. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you again, Ms. Malay. We appreciate it. So Thank you, Kathy. So we'll move on now to uh, ordinances and resolutions. We have a resolution authorizing the dissolution of the West Suburban Mass Transit District. Uh, Ms. Francis, are you going to do this one? Yes. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, in 1972, the West Suburban Mass Transit District was created. The district included the following communities, Berwyn, Brookfield, Clarendon Hills, Hinsdale, LaGrange, Lyle, Naperville, Riverside, Western Springs, and Westmont. Since its creation, the district has provided funding for improvements in member communities. The district has committed all their valuable all of their available funding to projects within member communities and there are no future funding sources for the district. On Mar October 21st, 2020, the district unanimously approved the resolution of dis dissolution. The district has requested that each member approve the resolution authorizing the dissolution. The district will provide a final grant in the amount of $6,500 to member communities. I wanted to make note that the Village of Riverside has received over $720,000 from the district over the past seven years. 
the village would like to thank Riverside resident and district trustee Jason T. Johns and previous district trustees from Riverside for their work and commitment to the district and the village over the years. I do want to note that Mr. Johns is also in the Zoom meeting if the board has any questions with regards to the dissolving of the West Suburban Mass Transit District. Questions, anyone? Mr. Pollock? I had a question for staff. I'm just curious, where did the funding for this come from? For the creation of it, I believe Mr. Johns is a little bit more versed on the subject matter. Um, but from what I am aware, are there were cars that were purchased and then leased out and ultimately sold. And that is where the revenue came from. Um, but I'm sure Mr. Johns could provide some additional um, history as it relates to that, if you'd like. If, if, if you'd like, I'd be happy to. Uh, the, the district was originally created as part of a, a public-private partnership for federal funding with the Burlington Northern. And the Burlington Northern donated cars, um, and then the federal government contributed money. Over the years, um, it, the district actually owned the cars, the, the commuter, uh, the cars and the, um, the locomotives that ran the BNSF uh, Metro line and leased them back to Metro, the, who then had a service agreement with, um, excuse me, leased them back to Burlington Northern, who then had a service agreement with Metro. Um, over the years, I think it was in early 2000s, they sold the locomotives and then I think it was about four years ago, we sold the last of our cars uh, and we actually sold them to Metro. So there's no more cars left um, and there's no more you know, sources of funding uh, available other than creating, um, uh, instituting a, a, a tax, which all of the member communities would need to approve. So instead of that, figured it's just time to dissolve the district. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time volunteering for it. Certainly, welcome. Yeah, Mr. Johns, we really do appreciate that you, you're you representing the village uh, on, in the district for, for these years. You're welcome. Any other questions? Happy to, I was happy to bring the funding to the village. <laughs> <laughs> we were happy to have you bring it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd ask for a motion uh, to uh, approve a resolution authorizing the dissolution of the West Suburban Mass Transit District. Make that motion. Oh, Motion by Mr. Pollock, I think I heard. Mm -hmm. Second by Mr. Galagos. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Um, Next up is under considerations is a discussion of the 2021 Economic Incentive Program for Riverside Businesses. Uh, Director Apt, are you gonna handle this one? Yes. So um, back when we had our initial CIP discussion, um, staff had asked the village board if they were interested in establishing a fund for economic incentives for 2021. And at that time, the board asked that the EDC take a look um, and provide some input on what these incentives could be and possibly a dollar amount. So at their last couple of meetings, uh, the commission has been discussing a possible incentive program um, for the businesses. They recommended postponing the um, First Avenue gateway sign um, and utilizing that money for an economic incentive program for the businesses. Uh, the budget for that sign included in the 2021 budget is $8,000. Um, the commission has suggested um, an incentive program utilizing specific criteria to evaluate applications and award grant money based on either budget restrictions um, or a 50-50 split um, and basically recommended an economic incentive program that would be for businesses that are located um, in our business district. So either in the downtown or in the B1 districts that they are existing businesses, that they must be a retail food service or personal service establishment um, and that the expense may not be made until after the applications are reviewed and approved. Um, eligible applicants would receive up to a 50% of verified qualified expenditures um, rebate, 
and all requests need to be submitted um, to the village for review um, and recommendation by the Economic Development Commission. Um, the criteria that was looked at and decided upon would be uh, first the total budget for the project, then looking at will the project allow the business to operate during COVID pandemic? Um, will the project better position the business to operate and succeed uh, during COVID and post COVID? Um, what's the aesthetic impact, um, such as the location or the magnitude of the improvement? Um, looking at consistency with our CMAP uh, Central Business District Plan or our business district plans that we have for the three business districts that um, we've enacted. Um, a demonstrated financial capability of the applicant and also funding availability and feasibility. The commission believed this program would show the village's commitment to its business community, especially during this difficult time, and stated it was important to roll the program out at the beginning of the year so that it could provide a quick response to our local businesses as they're trying to survive and adapt in the current pandemic, especially with the institution of tier two and tier three mitigation in um, Cook County. Uh, the commission also wanted to keep the program somewhat flexible and not create an individual grant maximum. Uh, given the limited budget and the low number of grant applicants the village has received in the past for other programs that we've offered, um, they believed reviewing the applications by merit and working with the 50% maximum refund within the budget would be sufficient. Um, I'd also like to mention that in 2020, the board did provide some economic relief, although it wasn't necessarily an incentive package. Um, with waiving our liquor license fees uh, for our businesses. And so that's um, effective through um, April of 2021. And then also with waiving the fees for the outdoor dining permits um, this year. Um, it, this time the village is also about to send out our business license renewal forms. Um, and so there are business license fees that will be coming due soon for our businesses as well. Um, I don't necessarily know if that's something that the village uh, board is interested, but that is another option um, for providing some sort of economic relief for our businesses um, at this time is looking at business license fees. So um, at this point, staff is looking for direction from the village board on whether we should create a resolution um, adopting this new proposed economic incentive um, program for our businesses for 2021. Um, and if there's any further discussion uh, regarding the business license renewals. So I have an initial question before I throw it to everyone else. The, the, the business license fees, how, how are the fees uh, calculated? Is it a flat fee that businesses pay? Yes, it's a flat $100 fee. Um, there are additional fees that are required based on the business type. So like for our restaurants, they have to pay additional fees um, for the health inspections. Is that the only one other one you can think of is the health inspection? I believe there's also additional fees for things like um, fuel pumps for our um, fueling stations. And then also I believe tobacco licenses have additional fees that are involved. Okay, so uh, trustees, what do you what do you think? Would, would you like the staff to move forward with drafting a resolution, putting some of these incentives into place? Mr. Gallagos? Yes, I would, absolutely. I'd also like to have a financial breakdown of what the uh, liquor license is and business license fees would be, so we can see if we can waive any of those, if that's a possibility. I know budgets will be tight, but um, I'd like to see a breakdown of that at uh, the next meeting as well, please. Ms. Evans? Yes, I'm very supportive of this. Um, it's a really thoughtful effort by the EDC. Um, I just wanted to find out why the Harlem business districts weren't included. I don't remember what was said. Do you oh, they are. So it's in the downtown or in our B1 district, which is the Harlem Avenue business mm -hmm. districts. So it includes. Oh, mm -hmm. oh okay. I seem, looks to me like we have a consensus that we'd like to move forward with this. Okay. Yeah, thank you to the EDC, yet another one of our commissions that's, that's doing stellar work behind the scenes. Uh, we're really grateful for everything they do. Uh, is that all you needed from us, Ms. Apt? Yes, we'll put together the resolution with the new um, policy and then we'll bring you back some numbers um, regarding the um, fees. Um, I do know that we get approximately $8,000 annually for business license fees, but I don't have the numbers um, for the liquor license fees. 
I mean, my personal opinion is during as long as as long as we're under the the mitigations that we're under, I would like to try to do everything we can to help our businesses and especially our restaurants because they're they're really struggling right now. Mm -hmm. Our liquor licenses run through April 30th, so it could be something that we revisit in the spring um, prior to uh, the renewal period um, and see where we're at at that time. Yeah, let, let, let's let's hope some of the the good news we're starting to hear about the vaccines might might take effect by then and maybe god willing by april or may maybe we'll, we'll all be going out to eat again with each other. that would be nice Ms. evans um yeah do, do we know how long it will take to develop the application and roll it out um, it shouldn't take too long. Um, once, uh, as we're putting together the um, resolution, we'll also put together the application. We've had one we created for the facade grant program, so that can be pretty easily adapted to, uh, for this. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any new business this evening? Hearing none, we do have need for an executive session this evening for the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body, the purchase of real property for the use of the public body, and pending probable or imminent litigation. So I'd ask for a motion and a second to adjourn to executive session to reconvene and no final action will be taken. I'll make that motion. By Mr. Galagos. I'll second. Second by Ms. Evans. Mr. Molina, did you have anything else at the end you needed to say? Yes, I did have one thing. Thank you, uh, President Sells. And we can do this very quickly. So it's important under the Open Meetings Act amendments for these virtual meetings that continue to occur uh, that everyone acknowledge that they were able to hear everything that occurred during the meeting, both as to being able to hear each other for those who are voting members and to be have been able to have heard all the discussion by any third parties, including me. Uh, so we can do this. Last time I went around one by one, um, if everyone can just raise your hand and acknowledge that you've been able to hear and understand that. And I think the recording also will bear that out. So it's Pretty, pretty good. It went very well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank President Sells. Thank you, Mr. Molina. If you'll please call the roll for adjournment. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone, and take care of one another.